All right. Hi, guys. Let me know if you guys can see my slides. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Kevin, and I'd like to welcome you all to our latest Novej webinar series episode. Uh, today, we are very happy to partner up with uh, none other than Tamsis Slider of VectorWorksTraining.co.uk. Uh, today, she's going to be covering not only site design, but tools for site terrain modeling, hard landscaping design, and of course, extensive tools for planting design. Uh, all this with VectorWorks Landmark 2013. Um, today, You'll also learn how to produce schedules directly from your own design for Landmark as well. And for those of you who aren't aware or who've read the book and uh, Tamsin's book but never actually got the opportunity to speak with her, um, Tamsin is a renowned expert on Vectorworks and regular author of training materials for Nemechek Vectorworks Incorporated. Uh, she has also pioneered the development of her own e-learning courses, providing opportunities for all to access Vectorworks curriculum in the way that suits them best. So yeah, I want to welcome Tamsin once again. This is awesome. Uh, she's also staying up late. I think it's 7 p.m. as we discussed briefly uh, earlier today. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming out. And um, we are so lucky to be doing this at 11 a.m. <laughs> Pacific time. <laughs> well, I hope you've had dinner already. Uh, but yeah, so if you guys aren't familiar with Novedge, uh, we are one of the largest online design software stores uh, in the U.S. and yes, arguably the world. Uh, if you're looking up to pick pick up a version of uh, Vectorworks Landmark 2013, you're more than welcome to check out our website at novich.com. Uh, from there, you can find a whole bunch of information. And if you guys are looking for more details on how to pick up your own uh, version of Vectorworks Landmark 2013, or if you want to give a quote, uh, you can contact our sales specialist, Vectorworks specialist, Bob Thayer. You can reach him at bob at novich.com. And I do want to plug uh, Tamsin's uh, website here. Uh, Tamsin, do you want to maybe put in a few good words? Uh, about the service that you're offering? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, um, I'm sure you're aware, we, we offer, we're the largest reseller of um, Vectorworks software in the UK, um, but we also offer training consultancy. And as, as Kevin's already mentioned, we, um, we offer access to that training in a variety of different ways. We offer sort of public classroom courses. We also offer one-to-one -one training. We have books. We have e-learning, all sorts of things. So talk to us. There's, there's probably a way we can help. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys are based in the UK, um, uh, definitely email your questions. Um, and I want to uh, encourage you guys to check out Townsend's services out there as well. So, moving on. All right. Uh, yes, Tamsin is an author, uh, and she's worked closely with Nemetrek Vectorworks to come out with the latest edition, the fifth edition of her uh, tutorial reference guide called the Residential Garden Design with Vectorworks Landmark. Uh, so we also have a version of it. We have copies of it at noveg.com, so you guys can pick it up if you guys are in the U.S. But uh, Tamsin, I'm sure you guys also have uh, copies uh, at your store yeah, as well. We, we certainly do, yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you are in the U.K., uh, yeah, definitely check it out there. And um, because I am the community manager at VectorWorking.com, I want to plug this. This is Novich's own little community for Vectorworks users. Uh, so if you guys want to check out the latest industry news, what's going on, who's using Vectorworks to make amazing, to create amazing designs, uh, definitely check it out at VectorWorking.com. And we do have a Twitter account, uh, which you can follow by its handle at VectorWorking. Um, also, um, I think we're going to get a lot of questions today. So if you guys, uh, if we don't answer all of them, um, I'm going to format them, forward it to uh, Tamsin, and when they're ready, we're going to share them at our blog.noveg. This is Noveg's own blog as well, so yeah, do check it out afterwards. Um, in our next upcoming webinar, we're going to be working with uh, ZBrush 4R6. Uh, Pixelogic's um, own Paul Gabri is going to be joining us on hand uh, to discuss um, some of the latest features like ZR Mesher, uh, along with the new brushes Trim and Crease. Uh, he'll also be walking us through how uh, you could use polygroups of Dynamesh to create unique workflows for design. Uh, so if you don't want to miss this, definitely don't miss this opportunity to check this out. Uh, this is coming up next week. So uh, this webinar is free, and it will last about an hour, and we'll include a q and session. So if you guys want to check it out, head on over to novich.com forward slash webinar forward slash 84. And if any chance, by any means, if you have to leave early, life sucks uh, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, if you guys want to rewatch this webinar, do head on over to vimeo.com slash noveg and youtube.com slash noveg. Um, by the end of the day, uh, I'll have these uh, webinars uploaded and ready to be shared on social media. 
uh, and through our channels as well. So yeah, definitely check it out there. All right. With that said, Tamsin, are you ready? I'm ready. This yes. This is going to be good. All right. Cool. Switching over to you right about. Now, here you go. Enjoy, guys. Okay. Right. So, welcome everybody, and thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy day to come and uh, watch the webinar. Um, I'm going to be talking, it, it, it's a great honor to be here again. It's a couple of years since I've did, uh, done a NoVeg webinar, so um, over the next 40 to 45 minutes, I'm going to give you a tour of Vectorworks Landmark, and we're going to focus mainly on the site that I hope you can see in front of you on my screen there. Um, one of the common questions that we're asked is, how do you deal with sloping sites? So this, this brief demo is going to give you an insight into that. Because of time constraints, the site is small, so I don't know if any of you guys are working on large, large, large landscapes, um, but the tools that you're going to use can clearly be scaled up to much larger sites. But uh, for a demo, it's nice to have something small and neat so that we can package it all in on the screen for you. Um, I will also show you some other example files at the, at the end of the webinar. But one of the key messages I want to get across here is that, that there are many people using Vectorworks Landmark and other CAD systems really as a 2D drawing tool. But it is so much more. It's so much more. Um, it can, if, if you use the intelligent tools within Landmark, you can create something that's both 2D and 3D by drawing it only once. And you can then create all of your plans, elevations, sections, etc., from that single model. But not, not only that, you can get schedules straight from it, so you can save yourself a whole bunch of work from counting at the end of the project. Um, and also make sure that changes are accommodated in your schedules easily. And of course, you will get, you know, almost as a side effect, fantastic visuals that will help you to market your designs. So this is the, the file that we're, we're going to work with. As I say, it is uh, purely 3D um, and, uh, well, purely 2D and 3D, I should say. And I'm going to open up the layer structure of this file. Um, now, I, I don't know, um, maybe you can tell me, guys, are you already Landmark users? Is there anyone here who's completely new to Landmark, or are you looking to pick up some new tips? Do let me know by just popping something in the chat or in the, in the questions, um, and just let me know. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to be working from scratch here. I'm going to take levels. We're going to look at how we can put in this building, how we can create the slope, and then create the landscape elements, and then adjust the slope so that these elements will sit nicely on that slope. So as I say, it's 3D. I can manipulate around that. It'll just quickly re-render. Um, but you can get the idea it is a, a fully 3D model. But if I just go back to um, a top plan view, then you'll see that this one single drawing is giving me that plan. And I could also look at it from the front, perhaps. And you could see if I were to render that up, I'd have a really nice elevation of the site. So we're, that's where we're going to be heading. Um, I may not have the time to put in absolutely every single piece of detail, but I will cover the whole range of tools that we're going to be looking at that, that you can be using in Landmark to create this kind of thing. So I'm going to start with a starter file here where I have, if I go to my draft plan layer here, what I've done is I've really sketched out in 2D the shapes that I'm going to work with for this. So you can al almost imagine this is your draft design. Um, I have the shape of the house here, which I may well have picked up from doing some measurements on site, or I could have imported this um, from a surveyor's file. I'm going to have some paving here. We're going to have some steps here, some more paving, some steps coming up to yet more paving. And we have some planting areas that we've designated around there. Now, you can see in the background, I've got various different levels showing. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually create that site. So I have those levels on a site levels layer here. Now, I've already created them for speed, but when I select one of these, you can see over on my object info palette here, which you can think of as almost a properties palette, um, this, is, this is an object that is a stake. And you can see it's, 
if I just zoom in, it's displaying its uh, elevation, but I can also see on the field here, the Z or Z field, depending on where you are, that this, this object has 3D properties. If I look at all of these objects from the front, you can see that they are kind of building up towards a slope, and what I want Vectorworks to do for me is join all, all of those up into a single object to represent the site. Now, if you have um, a survey created by your land surveyor, you simply need to request that information in a 3D format. And if you visit our website, we do actually have a download that you can give to your surveyor that will help you in determining or help your surveyor determine exactly the best format for you when you're working with Vectorworks. Uh, if you can't find it, just contact me after the webinar and I'll point you straight to that. It's a PDF download on how you can uh, specify that information. So what I want to do, rather than select an individual stake, is get hold of all of them. I'm going to use this Select Similar tool, which is often known as the Magic Wand tool, and just click on one of these which selects them all for me. So you can see over here I have 36 or is it 38? I can't quite see because my eyesight is going. But I'm going to go to the landmark menu and run the create site model command. Now that's going to convert that information into a single object for me. And um, I'm going to display initially just the existing site and I'm going to request that I have contour lines drawn for every 200 millimeters, apologies if you work in feet and inches, but uh, uh, we're metric here. So I'm going to say that uh, any visible layers can change this site, and then I'm going to click OK. So here is my site, and you can see there Vectorworks has generated the contour lines for me. So over on this side of the site, there's not much happening. Everything is a fairly level at one meter high, but then we're moving up the slope. And if I change to a 3D view, let's go for a left isometric view, you can see here, I just render with OpenGL, we can now clearly see that site. And we can start to understand what we're dealing with. So in terms of making design decisions, we've got a much better idea. I'm just going to pop back into the settings here and um, I'm going to make the minimum elevation zero so that where we've got that slight discrepancy on which color to display, we've actually got a little bit more substance to our site below the surface. So that gives us an indication of what we're working with. Having created that, I'm going to move it onto a layer called site model, which is what I would typically do. Um, the next thing that might be useful is to set up the north point for this. So I have a layer ready prepared for this. So I'm just going to go on to the sun layer and I'm going to pop into my visualization tools. And I hope you've all found the Heliodon tool if you are using Vectorworks already. Now this tool um, will enable me to choose where I am on the earth. It will provide, again, both a 2D and a 3D object, which will mark on my plan the direction of the sun, and it will also mark the date and the time and the location. But in 3D, it will actually produce a light source for our model. So I'm going to choose the UK, because that's where I am. And I'm going to pick Newbury, because that's where I'm sitting right at this moment in our lovely new office in the center of Newbury. And I'm also going to pick um, a nice green graphic for this. Now, if you don't find the city that you're looking for here, um, you can easily check the Edit City box and put the precise location of your site um, on the Earth. And then I can just pop that object in, and I could change the uh, rotation of that so that the top of the symbol is pointing to north. So there we have it. And this is giving me an indication of the direction of the sun and where the light is going to be in the sky. I could also now pop in here and change the date. So let's go for today's date, why not? We'll go for the 21st of August. And because that puts me in daylight savings, I'll just check the box there. And you can see now that the indication of light direction has changed. Let's go for 
11 a.m. as well. Great, so we've got that and we can always adjust that later if we need to. In terms of how that would change our model, later that will enable us to cast shadows, which is obviously a very important part of site analysis. So we've done our site and we've created the direction of light and also put a north point on there. Um, but what I'm going to do now is create our building. So again, I've created a layer ready for this. And I'm going to pop into the building shell tools. So I'm going to first of all use the wall tool. And you'll get very used to this throughout my demo. All of these tools that are down in these magical tool sets down here have a little preferences button here which enable us to choose how we want to work with this object. So I'm going to just choose a standard wall thickness here and I'm going to set a height for my building of 6 meters. Now because we are placing this onto a model, uh, it's quite important that I set the level for the base of the walls. And on the model here, we're working at around 1,000 millimeters. So I'm going to set a bottom offset of 1,000 and a top offset of 7,000. So the base of my walls will be at an elevation of 1 meter. The top of my walls will be at an elevation of 7 meters giving me a total height of 6 meters. I hope that makes sense. Um, now at the same time I can also set textures for my wall. So I'm going to choose that the left side of the wall should be textured with um, this specific texture here. I have a selection that I've already imported. I'm just going to go for this nice field stone here and click OK. So I've got my draft shape here. I'm going to trace over. So I'm working in a kind of familiar 2D drawing style. But having created those walls, if I then look at that in 3D, you can see that that is sitting nicely on my model. Let's just change the layer options to show snap others. And all is fine. So I've created this 2D, 3D object, which is sitting on the surface of the model quite happily. So um, let's pop some doors and windows in there. I'm going to do that very quickly and not populate the entire building. But with the door tool, once I click on the preferences, I can set in here the width of the door. So I'm going to go for um, a quite a wide door that takes us onto our paved area. And I'll set the width to 2 meters. And um, I'm going to make it a double door. And as you can see, there are many, many preferences and options that you can really get to know, perhaps um, when you've got a bit of spare time. But I'm going to set this to glass. And that immediately has changed both the 2D rep uh, representation of this, but also the 3D view of my door as well. And that will do for now, just for speed. And I'll pop that into the wall. There we are. So that's automatically cut it for me. Now, I remember my days on a drawing board many, many years ago. To achieve that, I would have been scratching away with a razor blade and uh, then popping the door into the right position. One question I'm often asked is, how do I get that door or window correctly positioned in the wall? And to do that, I'm just going to click the Set Position button and just measure that distance. You can use the Z key to quickly get in there. And I'm going to say that it should be, let's say, 1,500 millimeters from the end of the wall. And it's immediately positioned itself correctly. So let's just repeat that and pop in a window. So again, I have the Preferences button here. And I'll choose, let's see what sort of width I'm going to make. I'm going to go for um, quite large windows. It's going to be 1,500 wide and 1,700 high. And I'm going to set the elevation in the wall to be um, set, measured to the sill. And I'm just going to pop them at 500. Whoops, excuse my mouse there. Let's go back. Right. So if I then click OK, again, you can see that those windows are just inserting quite happily into the wall. And if we look at those in a 3D view, there they are. So... I could pop, again from this view, I could pop another window in, which I'll do just there. And on the object info palette, to pop that up to be a first floor window, all I need to do 
is change the elevation to something higher. So let's pop that up at three meters, and there you are. So I won't waste any more time on Windows, but you get the idea, hopefully. Now I'm going to use Select Similar to pick all of these walls and run Landmark Architectural Create Roof. Now again, many, many different options here, but the key thing is that because I've selected my six meter walls, uh, Vectorworks is automatically going to place this roof on the top of my building. So that's been done for me. Let's just look at it from the front and just check. Yeah, it has actually, it's, it's measured it from the uh, position of the layer. So I can go back into my roof there and just change that bearing height to seven meters. Oh, I should have done it for the entire roof. Nothing like a live demo for the odd little mistake. There we are. So there's my roof in position. And this time I'm going to render it by just choosing the render tab on the object info palette. And I'll just pop a nice wooden texture shingles on the top of that. So we're building our 2D, 3D model as we go. Right, now let me just let's see what kind of questions we have. If anyone's answered my question about, oh, okay, Luke, so you're already a Landmark user. Thanks very much for letting me know. I think we've spoken before, actually, um, and I think you've possibly attended some of my webinars with um, Nemetschek in the past. Uh, so that's great. Good to, good to see you again. Um, so what's next? Let's take a look then at putting in some paving. Now, to get the paving in, um, in a traditional 2D workflow, it would be very simple to just draw this rectangle and add a hatch or a tile fill onto that, and it would look lovely in plan, but Vectorworks wouldn't really have any understanding of what that rectangle represents. That would be down to um, the viewer to interpret, if you like. So instead, we're going to look at the hardscape tool which is found in the site planning tool set just down here, along with the stake tool, which we used earlier for our levels. So this hardscape tool, what can it do for us? Well, it can draw areas of paving. It can also draw pathways. So it's very, very clever, and it has the good old preferences button. So let's see if I can click on there. And from here, I'm going to set up my paving. Now, I quite often will meet, for, for those who are used to working in a 2D environment, I might need a little bit of resistance here because you've got to start filling in all these dialog boxes. However, you only need to define your type of paving once because it then can be saved as a library item on your resource browser and then just dragged onto any plan that you're working on. Um, and you can easily swap materials out in front of the customer if you need to, and your schedules will automatically update. So it's well worth putting in that little bit of extra effort. So I would usually use the name field to um, specify the type of material that I'm using, but here I'm just going to use the name paving. Um, I can automatically have this labeled. On this occasion, I'm probably not going to put on a label, I'll just leave it as none, but note that you can choose how much information you're going to include in there. I can also specify what this is going to look like in a 2D view, and I'm going to pick a tile fill. So there are a number of tile fills here, but I've imported one of my tile fills into this drawing already. Note again that you can download these tile fills from my website, so again if you can't find them, just contact me afterwards, they're, they're available for you to use. So I'll pick that, so we'll set the, the plan view. We're drawing an area or boundary of hardscape here. It's not going to be a specific pathway. And I'm not going to add a border, but note that you can. So you could specify a second material to edge your hardscape with if you need to. To make this 3D, it's simply a case of choosing the 3D type. Now I could use a slab, which would give me um, a flat area with a thickness, but because we have a site model here, I'm going to choose a pad modifier. And that will give me a thickness in 3D, but it will also include a special element that sits underneath my hardscape that will actually flatten out the site for me. So that's quite important to pick, and I'm going to set just a, a thickness of 30 millimeters there. And here I can pick 
the 3D texture that I want to use. So I'll go for this tile, travertine, dark brown, and just click OK. Now I can sketch, well, actually what I need to do is go to my hard landscaping layer just to be neat and organized. And if I'm really thinking organized, I should probably pop this in its own class so that it's clear what's what. Now I'm being quite careful here when I'm drawing these elements and making sure that they don't quite touch. Now for those who are used to working extremely accurately, um, you're wondering why don't they quite touch? Well, in fact, when you are creating elements that adjust a site model, it's important that if they adjust the site model at different elevations, that they don't quite touch. Vectorworks does not like vertically aligned data points on a site model, so it will cause issues. So just note that top tip. I've quite often asked, I'm receiving a message from Vectorworks that says I have touching or intersecting pads. What's the problem? Well, the problem is you have touching or intersecting pads, and the only solution to that is to move them apart. So there's my first piece of paving, and all I need to do now is set that at my desired elevation. So this first one, I'm going to pop at uh, 1,030 millimeters, and you'll just have to go with me on that. I've kind of worked out the levels in advance here, so I will happily do that. And I'll sketch in the next one. Remember, you can always use the Z key if you need to see quite closely what's happening on your screen. So let's just snap to that corner there, and into here, and back up to where I started. So that's my second piece of paving, which I'm going to set at a different elevation of 1606, and that's done. And then the final piece up here. Now this one is going to be a slightly different shape. So I'm going to draw in the rectangle and I'm going to ignore that circular piece for the moment, although we will include that very shortly. So that's my initial piece. I'm now going to just draw a circle over that draft shape. Because what I want to show you is that I can take that basic shape and I've now selected both objects and I'm going to go to the Modify menu and just choose Add Surface. And that has drawn in that complex piece of arc there for me without me having to do anything complicated. I've simply added two shapes together to make one more complex shape. And this one we're going to sit at an elevation of 3.3 meters. So again, now let's look at that in a front view. And you can see there our original slope, which hasn't changed yet, but we have now these three different terraced areas, and the red line underneath them indicates the site modifier. That's the magic bit that's going to change this slope for us a little bit later in the demo. So we have our hardscapes created. Um, what I'm going to do now is pop in some walls, and we're going to have walls in this area here that will represent our pool. So I'm going to go back to my wall tool, which we used earlier for the building, and change the settings. So this time, we're going to have walls that are a bit thicker. Oh, perhaps not five meters thick. Let's just go for 500 mil. And I'll set my insertion options. So my height is going to be 600 this time. And I'll set the bottom offset to a meter and the top offset, it's calculated then as 1,600 millimeters. Now, often there is confusion about this. The layer itself is at zero. The bottom of the wall is therefore going to be one meter above the layer, but consistent with the position on the site model. So I'll click OK. In fact, let's just check my textures. We're going to use exactly the same texture for the outside of the pool walls anyway. So um, let's also apply that texture to the right. And I'm also going to choose a texture for the top. And I'll use something 
ever so slightly different here so that we can represent more of a, a coping finish. I'll go for this one here. So I can sketch in my walls. Again, I'll just be very careful that I don't have everything quite touching. I, I am exaggerating the gap here, but I really do want to make this point that when you're working with a site model, you do not want everything to be jammed up against each other. So how's that looking from the front? And there it is, and it's perfectly in position. It's exactly where I want it to be. So that's my first set of walls. Now, um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to just put in one retaining wall here, um, and you'll so you will return to the finished model a little bit later so that you can assess the impact of that. But I just want you to get the chance to see as many of the 2D, 3D tools as you can. So I'll just pop that in there. So I have a wall, and this time I want to change its, um, its elevation. So in this case, it's still going to have a thickness of 500, but its top offset, which, which I can adjust after I've created it, is going to be at 3,800 um, millimeters. And the bottom offset is going to be, um, oh, actually, no, that's not what I wanted to do at all. That's going to put them far too high. Let's go for 2137. That's a bit more like it. And 1637 for that bottom offset. So again, just checking that from the front, you can see there that we have um, some walls in there, which are going to, in fact, bring the slope down and retain it before we come down to this paved area here. Now remember, I've left a sneaky little gap in there as well. So how could we, how could we perhaps add in some steps? Now steps, I see people spending a lot of time working out steps with calculators and drawing lines and offsetting them. We're going to use the custom stair tool to create these lower steps here. And I'm going to go into the preferences. And the first time you select the custom stair tool, it will offer you a range of starter stairs. And even if they don't look exactly as you want them, you just pick one and go with it, because everything can be adjusted. So I'm going to pick a straight stair, and then just click OK. And while that opens up, I've gone to the general tab here where I can specify the information about my steps. For these lower steps, I'm going to go for um, a level change of 607 millimeters. It's extremely precise, but just go with me. I have worked it all out in advance. So um, I'm going to go for a tread width of 2 meters. So my, st my stair is going to be 2 meters wide. And then I'm going to have a tread depth so of 450, so a sort of paving slab depth. Now, I can specify the maximum size of riser that I'm prepared to tolerate for this. So if you're working to specific materials, you can put that value in and bear in mind that you may need to adjust things with mortar, etc. But you will have an idea of what is tolerable for people to walk up and down. So I've set 154 there, and having set that value, Vectorworks has now worked out for me that to cross this level here, I need four risers. And the next step is for me to adjust how those risers are going to work. So here's a preview of my stair in plan view. What I want to do to that is add a little platform. So we're going to have some steps that come up to um, a paved area, effectively. And I'm going to add a straight platform onto this stair. And I'm going to set it to be 2 meters by 2 meters and just apply that. So I've now got only three steps. And then I have my top step is this platform area. So Vectorworks is preventing me from creating more risers. It knows that I can only have four, but it will allow me to shuffle them and adjust them as I wish. 
So let's take a look at the construction method here, and you can see a little 3D preview. I'm going to choose masonry. And from here, I can also set my nosing depth and the tread thickness. I'm going to make it 30, the same as my hardscapes. And I can also use classes. Now, Vectorworks uses classes to define what different types of objects are, what the purpose of the objects that you've drawn is, but also it uses it to apply graphic attributes and also 3D textures. So in this case, I've set up a series of classes that store these materials in them, and I'm going to use the class Fieldstone for the tread, and then for the risers, I'm going to have closed risers, and I'm going to use this stone class. So we'll have slightly different risers to treads, but the, the top of the steps will be the same as the paving material. Now I'll click OK, and you can see I now have a preview of my steps. The cursor is holding onto those steps by their center, so I'm just going to pop them into the area that I've designated. It's automatically labeled them for me. You can turn that off if you don't need it. But again, the important thing we need to do there is set the Z value for that, and I'm going to put it at 1030, the same as the hardscape below. So we have a number of objects now that are landscaping elements. And um, I'm going to move on and take a look at perhaps creating some modifiers to change this site. So let's go back to the site model layer. And from there, I'm going to create some elements that will allow this site to update. One of the key things we need to do is determine how much of the site can be updated. If you had a huge site and you were simply adding a small terraced area to that site, the last thing that you would want to happen is that the entire slope would be regraded just to accommodate your paved area. So we need to limit that. And I'm going to go into the um, I'm going to go into the tools here and choose the Site Modifiers tool. Now, Site Modifiers, there is a single tool that can do so much for your site. You can see here it has a number of different configurations. So we have a grade limit, which enables us to, as I say, limit how much of the site is changed. But we can also create pads, which will flatten the site. We can create pads with retaining edges, which will allow us to cut into the site but have vertical edges around the side. We can create spoil piles, which will enable us to add in, um, to, to reduce spoil that's left over after our redesign. And we can also apply texture beds, which will simply paint the surface of the model with a different texture. So I'm going to start with my grade limits object and click OK, and let's just trace over one of the draft shapes that I've provided here, or just keep that within the site here. Let's just be fairly rough about that, just the speed. Just take it into the edge there. And essentially, I'm going to bring it back to here, and then back to my start point. So I have this new object now. Now if I go back to the site model itself and I click Update, what's happening now is the contours are adjusting to suit those elements that I've placed on the plan. Or maybe not, as is always the case in a live demo. No, nope, it's kind of worked. Some of them have and some of them haven't. Always the way. So what have I forgotten to do? Let me go back into my site model settings. And here's the key thing. I'm currently displaying the existing site only. So for my 3D model and for my 2D model, I'm going to change the properties of the site. And now you can clearly see those contours have adjusted. And we'll take a look at that in 3D, and just a quick render. And you can see now my flattened hardscape areas have created 
have been created. So I have much more of a terraced slope now. So those were modified simply by the hardscape tool itself. But what we want to do is flatten the area here where we have the pool. And you can see that the terrain is currently just running straight from one terrace to the next. So we have a rather sloping base for the pool. It could be that that's what you want, but in this case, we don't. So I'm going to go to my site modifiers layer. And I'm going to go back to the site modifiers tool, go to the preferences. And this time, I'm going to choose to create a pad. And I'll zoom in to look at the edge of my walls. Here we are. Here's one. And zoom in here. And just be very careful that this doesn't end up touching my hardscape pad because Vectorworks will not like it and it will complain. So let's get that done. Right, so I have this new object. We can see here that it is a site modifier and that it's a pad. So the only thing I need to do to it is change its elevation. So this is going to be at a meter and 10. That will do fine. And if we go back to the site model now, you can see the big striped border around its edge. Now this is because Vectorworks is indicating to me that something has changed, but it's not yet displaying that change. So again, I need to update the site. And you can see there the contours are now accommodating that further change that we've made. And if we look at that in 3D, you can see that the base of the pool has now been flattened. So that's really just the start with site modifiers. There's much, much more that you can do. In fact, I promised you a retaining wall. So let's do that with this wall here. And to do that, I need to be on the layer where the wall was created. But I'm going to select this wall. Remember, this one is further up the slope, and it has a very specific height. When you're creating retaining walls, it's quite important to select your wall and have a look at the direction of that wall. So you can see here that it has a direction arrow, which clearly shows you which is the left side and which is the right side. So if I'm standing here looking along my wall, this is the left and this is the right. I'm going to go back to the landmark menu and I'm going to choose to create a retaining wall site modifier. Now, the first thing this will do is create a pad underneath the wall so it will flatten out for the excavation of the wall, if you like. And you can offset that from a uh, to some distance from the base of the wall, but in my case, I want it to be exactly there. Um, and then I can specify the side edges. So I'm going to have a modifier on the left edge, which is going to be um, offset from the base of the wall. And I'm just going to offset it 45 millimeters. Now on the right side of the wall, I'm going to offset from the top of the wall. And this time I'm going to go for 65 millimeters so that that comes into one brick course. And it will automatically include modifiers on the edge of the wall so that you can control how the soil interacts with the edge of the wall there. So I'll click OK. And that's created this new object. It's called a retaining wall site modifier. And in a 3D view, you can make further adjustments to it. So if you wanted your wall to disappear into a bank, for example, you could use the reshape tool on this and make adjustments along how that, can, how that will control the soil. In my case, I'm going to leave it just as it is, just for the sake of speed, but I'm going to select the site model and just click Update. And what you'll see there is that the soil has wrapped to the back of the wall and then is coming away at the base of the wall in line with our hardscape. So if we just flick back to the original site, that we had, I'm going to go to an isometric view there and just remind you that effectively we've just created this wall here. Um, and the site modifier is sitting on it. So if I just render that quickly with OpenGL, just for speed, oh, you can't see it because it's got a massive tree in the way. 
but it's this wall here that we've just created and and so let's return to our other model and just pop some of the other elements in so that you can get an indication of how they work now furniture and people and other bits and pieces anything that you may have modeled yourself um, you can easily pop on if you create them as symbols oops, then you can locate those on your resource browser I have some examples here so if I wanted to put a barbecue or a grill on this terraced area here I can pop that on it's first of all being created at an elevation of zero but what I can do is send that let's put it on a layer so that's above the site so you can see it but what I can do with it is just run this send to surface command and that will automatically place it on the surface of the model so if we would just repeat that process with a little bit of um, furniture just here so I've got my automatic plane detection turned on and I'll pop in that element there and that's automatically sat on the surface as well so um, very very easy to work with these different levels not a problem at all all right so let me just have a quick check and see if any of you have asked any questions let's see um, where are we uh, there was a question there from James so all the boundaries need to be separated for tracing purposes because of the issue you highlighted about Vectorworks before um, that's correct yes essentially the the site model is a series of triangulated no, triangles that connect up um, if they touch then where they touch one set of elevations will be ignored and it's the last set of elevations that were drawn will be ignored so the first object that's created is the one that will have an impact on the model the second one wouldn't um, so it's it's um, you just need to have them ever so slightly apart um, they rectangle and circle shape overestimate um, will will the rectangle and circle shape overestimate the amount of hardscape no it will it will count the exact area of the hardscape so I think the point of your question is that you would need to include um, cuts to create the circle and if that's the case yes you would but you could include that on your schedule you could include in the calculation um, something that, uh, that adds in whatever you need for cutting that circular area so another question um, Oh, is it possible to draw this in a full 3D view rather than from top plan view? Yes, it is, although if you have a site model, um, you have an awful lot of points there that your cursor will want to snap to. So um, you may find that a little bit of a nuisance, but it is, it is entirely possible to do that. Uh, then I've got a question there. Gosh, um, I hope that was a good gosh but maybe not perhaps you could elaborate uh, thank you Luke um, that's great um, James okay thanks where is the automatic plane detection oh now that's a good question uh, when you're in a 3d view if you look at your planes here then if you have um, an object that you're about to draw it will automatically flick to that option there if you have um, an older version of Vectorworks try and avoid or if you have the newer version of Vectorworks I should say really try to avoid working in screen plane it is really there for legacy purposes and you want to be drawing in layer plane or automatic plane and that will just snap to any surface in your model so if I were to start drawing here I can draw directly on this roof for example or this roof face or this wall so hopefully that's answered that one. Um, oh, big smile there from James. So hopefully I did answer that question correctly. Excellent. So I will carry on talking. Um, now, I, with 45 minutes I've been talking for, so that I, I would talk for England, so I need to keep an eye on myself. But what I want to do is move on to planting. Um, there is much more I could tell you about site modeling, but we do actually run a site modeling course, and it is a full 
day of training. So very hard to compress into just 45 minutes. But let me move on to planting. As garden designers, landscape designers, obviously planting plans are key. Um, whether you choose to present beautiful plans to your customers or whether you are creating planting plans so that you can just count the things and get quotes from the nursery, um, Vectorworks offers a, a range of solutions. So we have the plant tool, which will enable you to place individual plants either on their own or in groups, but you also have a landscape area tool here, which is ideal if you're doing larger schemes or if you're wanting to do something like bulb underplanting, for example, um, where you really do not want to sit and draw each plant. You want to create a mix of plants. Um, so I'm going to just concentrate with this model on the plant tool. You can see here up on the toolbar that it has lots and lots of different ways that I can place plants. If I go into the preferences here, then I can choose to define a new plant. I have some that I've already set up here. So I've got some box balls, I've got some um, Judas tree, I've got the standard coniferous shrub, I've got some iris to go in the pond, and some lavender, and I've also got an elm tree here. So let's pick the elm and let's look at the definition for that. Within this plant tool, I can choose the spread, the height, the spacing. I can specify the Latin name, what the common name is, if I want that to appear on the plan. I can also tell the nursery which size I'd like them to quote for. And I could also put some comments in here. If I'm not going to be planting it myself, I can ensure that the person who is planting it makes sure that the roots go in first and that the green stuff goes up at the top. Um, I can choose how beautiful I want my plans to look. So here I have a nice little shadow in 2D and um, I can change that maybe to a solid color. So let's go for maybe a cool gray and let's reduce the opacity of those shadows as well. One of the things I really like about being able to define the shadows in Vectorworks 2013 is that I can set those shadows as a factor of the plant height. And that means that each plant will have a slightly different size shadow based on the height that's been set up in its insertion options. So that can give your, your planting plan a little bit of um, coolness, as I should say. Uh, we can also define how the tag's going to be displayed. So in this case, I'm just going to have the Latin name. And I'll click OK. And let's just, for neatness, go to my planting layer. Now, one of the nice things about this is if I pop a plant on and there is a site model present, although the Z value remains at zero, let's just place a little group up here. Each plant automatically detects the surface of the model. And they look a bit strange in a 3D view because planting 3D plants are actually using a 3D plane with a photographic image of that plant projected onto it. We can only see that when we render the scene. But there you are, you can see each plant has automatically picked its correct level. Even when I've placed it as a single group of three plants, each plant is at the correct level. So that makes it very, very easy to work in this, in this um, environment, I should say. So let's just pop another couple of plants in. Let's go for this mode here, and I'll just pop in um, a box ball for good measure on our slope here and you can see I can double click there now it's only put one plant in but the reason for that is purely down to the spacing so on the object info palette I'm going to change the spacing to a meter and now it knows how many plants I can fit into that space again let's look at that in 3d and you'll see our box balls are sitting on our retained edge just above that wall. And we've got some lovely shadows there as well, being cast by the sun. And so it's all looking rather beautiful. It's obviously not finished, but 
um, it was never going to be in the in the short time span. So what I would like to do now is leap back to the finished model just to remind you of what you could achieve with that. So here was our ready-made demo. So here, oh, something has gone wrong with my steps, but we'll just live with that. Yes, I do want to re-render everything. That's fine. So here I've got um, just more elements created with the custom stair tool. I've lost my site modifier that's fixing that problem for me. Um, but I have plants. I have texture beds. I talked about different site modifiers doing different things. One of the site modifiers will act as a texture bed, and that's cutting this mulch texture into those planted areas, whereas the rest of the site model has this grass texture across it. Um, and we have lots of lovely little people there, and we have a nicely modeled 2D, 3D pergola there, and we've just drawn 3D polygons and stuck a nice texture of some roses over there to give a nice finished impression. Now if we look at the sheets that I've created, because one of the important things about this is it's a single model from which we can get lots and lots of output. Um, I'll go to my first sheet, and here I have um, four different views of the garden. Um, the stripy border simply means that Vectorworks knows I've been playing with the design layer, so it believes this viewport may be out of date. But you can see how a 3D visual really does help you sell your ideas to your customers. And there we are. You can also see the physical sky background, which is a lovely feature in 2013, which is actually giving us quite a realistic light coming in to the sky there. And here we've got an evening scene with these lovely folks sitting around this fire pit. So all of those elements just interacting nicely with that terrain model. But of course, we also need a nice plan with some contours on that we can give to the contractor so he can make sense of this. So I have a 2D plan there and another view of this without any of the junk, just the contours. And all of that is generated just from one model. There's no redrawing at all involved. To finish up my presentation, what I'm going to do is flip over to the file that the book, Residential Garden Design with Vectorworks Landmark, that Kevin um, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. This, this book will help you create this model effectively. So here is our 2D plan view, and this is including everything on the site, but it doesn't have much in the way of labels. In fact, it is showing um, a landscaping, uh, the landscape area label there, but I can just turn off the tags for that um, and get rid of that. So this would be the nice master plan that gets your clients to say, wow, yes, I love it. But so often now when everybody's kids is play are playing on PlayStation and working in a 3D world, I often find it's hard for people to interpret plans. So having that 3D visual is great. And this is quite simply a camera view stuck onto that model and showing the client some various little magical spaces within that. Um, so this pergola was modeled just using the push-pull tools within Vectorworks, and many of the other elements just came straight out of the libraries. If you prefer a more artistic look, this is one of the standard um, render styles that comes with artistic render works, and I've just adjusted the pen colors there to create quite a soft look, but included the shadows as well. And we also are able to show the clients that little seating area and what it's going to look like as the sun goes down and they switch on their lighting that's inset within the paving, etc. So we can give them all of that magic by just modeling once, and it is just a case of using the right tools. Um, from that, we can then derive construction details. So here I've got a viewport which is showing the model but without any planting and it's showing which materials have been used. And we've also taken a detail viewport, which is showing the detail of the steps. And this is a section viewport, which is slicing through those 3D steps and showing us the overall 
geometry of them. I've then added annotations to that viewport to show exactly how I want that to be built. And then finally we have a section through the pool. I talked about schedules. Schedules are built into Vectorworks. They're just part of its of its homeland really. It's, it's um, something that you can pull straight off a menu or out of the resource libraries and you can adjust them. So this particular schedule is looking at the different areas that I've created with the hardscape tool and telling me how much they measure. So what's the area, what's the border area, what's the footprint so I can cost ex excavation, I can cost haunching, I can cost um, pointing etc. Uh, it's counting elements in there so I have some individual slabs going across the garden and those are counted for me. I've also got areas of wall surfaces being counted for me so that I can work out how many bricks I need um, according to the specific bonds that I want. And then finally I have my planting plan here and you can see yet another schedule which is pulling off the quantities of plants and those that have individual symbols it's even showing me the symbol so that I can locate those on the plan. And here we have the planting plan itself which is showing the rest of the plan grayed out but showing me the individual plants. Now I could choose if I know that that's going to go out on site I could choose to just make that black and white so that I don't waste lots and lots of beautiful colored ink to create that. So I think I have some more questions. Let's have a look. How do you slope the hardscape terraces to direct surface water to drainage points? That's a really good question. Now I, if you're wanting to do that, um, it would be a case of using pads rather than using the hardscape tool with pads. So you would draw your hardscapes as hardscapes. Um, a hardscape itself cannot slope, but you can put a slope onto a pad and you simply create the uh, elevation that you want and then set the slope value and you can adjust the angle of that slope as well. So you would effectively draw a pad for each angled slope that you're going to create. hope that answers that one for you. Um, if you want a more photorealistic model in Vectorworks, which software would you use? The Vectorworks Architect 12 user, is that uh, 2012 or is that um, Vectorworks version 12, which is now quite old? Um, hopefully you can answer that for me and then I can answer your question. Um, how did I define the boundary or limit of my site model? That's from Jane. Hello Jane, uh, nice to hear from you. Um, I used the site modifier tool which is just here and I set the mode to grade limits and I then just drew the area that I wanted to include to be updated. You can have as many boundaries as you need or grade limits as you need but they mustn't be touching and they mustn't be intersecting. So if they need to touch or they need to intersect then you don't need more than one. You simply draw one big area. Hopefully that answers that for you. Uh, quick cut and fill calculation, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, let me just go back to my model that I made here. And let's have a quick look at it. So, I don't need it to render really. Let's stop that. Um, let's go back to OpenGL. So, if I select the site model, um, there we are. If I select the site model, and I just need to minimize that, I've got the model selected here, and if I go to the object info palette and scroll down, you'll see here update cut and fill calculations. If I click that button, then I can see here the volume of the existing site, volume of the proposed. I have cut 38 cubic meters, but I have filled 40 cubic meters, so I have a net cut and fill volume of 2 cubic meters of fill that are required to create this site. So hopefully that helps answer that one. And um, let's see, so uh, really Landmark does offer BIM data, yes that's a very good question. 
James, um, it does indeed offer BIM data. It, it, it's, that's quite a bigger question, really. BIM and the landscape, um, if you were to look at things like IFC classification definitions, there isn't much within that that, has, that includes landscape elements. But things like slabs, um, walls, etc., are all important key parts of the landscape, and they do. And if you have Vectorworks Designer, you'll see that um, if you look at the object info palette, the IFC data is there, and this is going to be exported as the IFC site. So I could share this with anyone who's using BIM compliant software, IFC compliant software, and they would be able to look at my intent. So there is no reason why people can't use the landscaping software of their choice um, to collaborate in a BIM product. So, oh, thank you very much, Susan. That's not a question, but that's a lovely, lovely compliment and very nice to hear from you, and I hope you're well. How do you convert a planar layout of the plan to full 3D automatically? Do you need to redraw this in mind after setting your site elevations? Is there a way to project the 2D plan to 3D and start from there? Mm, I'm not sure that I, well, I suppose I've shown you drawing the objects uh, rather than having them convert. But if you had a 2D plan, let's say I just draw a rectangle here. There is a magic command within Vectorworks, create objects from shapes. It's under the landmark menu. If I choose that and just bring that back onto my screen, I can choose what kind of object I want that to be. So I could convert that shape into a hardscape. And if I then look at the settings, that's already 3D because it's remembered the last things I do. So that object is both 2D and 3D, and I've simply converted a 2D shape to create it. I could also create walls in the same way. So if I had that shape on a draft plan, create objects from shapes. Let's go for walls, and there they are. Now, it's positioned them down the center, but I had control over that. I just clicked the button too quickly. Um, but you can see those are completely 3D objects, just converted from those rectangles. So hopefully, that answers that one. Uh, if you are a 3D modeler, though, if you've perhaps used other modeling applications where you're doing direct modeling, why not just start in a 3D view and just pull and then draw? and pull. It's really, really easy. So, um, yeah, there's no reason why you can't model in that way. And it, you've got full snapping, etc. And if I just render that, there are those objects. So hopefully that answers that one. Uh, that was from Yelena. Uh, version 12. Uh, so it is version 12, old version 12 from Renato there. The question about uh, creating photorealistic renderings. Well, I'm using RenderWorks, which is which is built into my Vectorworks 2013 workspace, and that render engine is based on Cinema 4D, which is a nice high-end rendering application, and so I haven't really had to do anything very special to get that uh, photorealistic render. So uh, perhaps that's something we could talk about offline if you wanted to so I can perhaps get to the bottom of your question. Uh, Susan, I missed how you got the black and white drawing. Oh, let's just go back to that one. Nice, easy one. Select your viewport. On the object info palette, down at the bottom, you've got advanced properties. Black and white only. Easy peasy. Can you import contours? This is from Philip. Can you import contours rather than elevation points? to create the site model. Yes, you can. Um, as long as the contours are 3D, then you can create a site model from that. There's just one word of warning I would give you there. If your surveyor is giving you beautifully smoothed contours, each contour will have millions of points along it, which is probably unnecessary for the model that you want to create. Um, so ask your surveyor not to smooth the contours. Um, and try to get contours that include the minimum amount of points that are necessary, really, to convey the site accurately. But yes, I could have selected a whole series of 3D polygons 
to create my site. So yes, that's fine. Um, just a reminder there, we do have a data sheet on our website which will help you um, determine the most appropriate starter data for your uh, site model. Oh, get it, thank you very much. That's lots of lovely compliments there. Uh, Luke, thank you very much. Um, excellent. I know that I've gone over the hour now, so I do apologize for keeping me. Uh, keeping you all, Tamsin, how do you do subtraction in push-pull? Okay, so we'll make this the last question. Let me go back to my demo, and then we're going to wrap things up after this. Um, but if there are any further questions, I know that Kevin did say he would pass them on to me, so I'm more than happy to answer them. So how do you subtract with push-pull? So here's my push-pull object. I'm now going to draw another object on the side here, click on the surface and push through and this is one of those things that isn't great if you're not in the room but I'm now pressing the alt key on my Mac keyboard and I'm then going to click and it's cut a hole. So there you are. Hopefully that will help you Susan. It might be that you, I know you're a PC user or are you now a Mac user, I can't remember, um, but use I try the control but it's usually alt that will do it. So I hope you've all found that useful. I've really enjoyed putting this together and um, hopefully you can see I'm completely passionate about Vectorworks Landmark um, and I love to see people making full use of it. So please do send further questions and we'll take it from there. So I'm going to hand back to Kevin now. Um, not quite sure what I have to do for that. Maybe I have to stop showing my screen and hand back to Kevin. Is that right? Um, yes, Tamsin, um, I actually I could do that myself. I'll do that okay, right about you can. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I do hear my voice uh, in the background. It's a bit of an echo, but let's see. Here we go. All right. Let me know if you guys can see my screen here. Excellent. I can see your screen, so I'm guessing awesome. everybody else can. Sweet. Yeah, so on behalf of the Novich team, I want to thank you for attending. Uh, thank you to the attendees. Um, for those in the UK and also in the States, for those of you guys who are staying up, um, Tamsin, I think it's about 8 p.m. right about now. Uh, in the UK, yes? It is, yes. It is <laughs> quarter past eight. I'm sorry, everybody, if I've kept you from your dinner. I'm certainly starving now. So. Yes, I was going to ask you if you had dinner already. <laughs> but uh, yes, so to second uh, what James said, wow, that was an amazing presentation. Uh, this is really cool. We're really glad to work with, once again, with Tamsin out in the UK. And if you guys are there, um, some of you guys are actually nearby, Newberry, do check it out. Send an email. Please contact Tamsin. Her services, her knowledge is amazing. All right. So if you are in the U.S., by any means, uh, noved.com is one of the largest online design software stores. If you are looking to pick up a version of Vectorworks Landmark 2013, uh, we have it available in the U.S. However, if you are looking to pick up a version and to get some training in the U.K., um, head on over to vectorworks-training.co.uk. This is Tamsin's um, one of uh, this is Tamsin's company that she founded, and if uh, Tamsin, do you want to add maybe another plug uh, for your website and the services that you offer? Yeah, sure. As you can see there from the site, um, if you're looking for training, if you just click on Learn Vectorworks, you'll see the full range of courses that we offer. We also have Buy Vectorworks there, and we do have an online store there. So if you're just looking to buy and you're in the UK, that's the place to go. Um, but you meant you, I also mentioned some other bits and pieces. We do have a blog on there, so if you go to contact us, there is a blog, and you can subscribe to that. We do a monthly technical blog, um, a little sort of how-to, so please do subscribe to that. Um, we also offer consultancy for larger firms who are looking to set up standards, etc. But you can also see along the bottom there in the grey box the, the full range of uh, Vectorworks solutions that we work with. So we don't just work with landscape people, we work with architects, we work with kitchen and bathroom designers, interior designers, lighting designers, theatre designers. Uh, we have a large team now, so we're here to help. Tamsin, you also, uh, also, also mentioned in the presentation um, how that you will be offering data sheets as well. That's right, yes. Um, if, if you go to our website, in fact, at the bottom of every single page, there is a link to that data sheet which will tell you how to ask your surveyor for the correct information to create a site model. So you're very welcome to help yourself to that, or if anybody would prefer me to send that as an email, please do contact me. I'm more than happy to send it. Um, 
uh, there are some further there are some blog posts about site modeling um, on our blog so please do have a look at that but again if you look at other services we do have a free downloads on there um, and that has um, the tiles and I also have a library of plants there which people are very welcome to help themselves to um, if you're a landmark user you can just have those so uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is a screen capture, but if I had the browser open, I would scroll down and click on everything that Tamsin mentioned. But yeah, do check it out. And uh, if you guys, Landmark user, uh, definitely check out the latest edition, the fifth edition of Tamsin Slider's Residential Garden Design with uh, Vectorworks Landmark. We offer, uh, we do offer, we sell it at Novich.com, but also if you are in the UK, do check it out at Tamsin's website. Cool. Uh, and we, Novich has it. We, we have our own online vector working um, community called vectorworking.com. Uh, you could also follow us at Twitter. Uh, we're going to share the rest of the questions with Tamsin and we're going to make it a blog post so that everybody can get their uh, questions answered as well. So moving on. In our next upcoming, web, upcoming webinar, we're going to be uh, talking about ZBrush 4R6. Uh, Paul Gabri from Pixel Logic will be joining us. And to make it quick, if you guys want to find out more information about this free webinar, uh, head on over to novich.com slash webinar slash 84. And because I am the webinar organizer, organizer, I encourage you guys to, if you guys have any questions, please send them in, uh, feedback, um, ways that we can improve. I look forward to hearing them as well. All right, moving on. And today's webinar will be shared and uploaded on our channels at vimeo.com slash noveg and at youtube.com slash noveg. So uh, look forward to that. And you're going to find links in the follow-up email to uh, today's webinar as well. Uh, with that said, um, do check us at facebook.com uh, and also check us out on Twitter at noveg where we'll be interacting with Tamsin as well. So yeah, um, with that said, uh, Tamsin, do you have any last words before we say goodbye or no, just thank you very much all for attending and thank you very much for your kind comments. Cool. All right. You guys have a good one. Please enjoy dinner um, and the rest of your evening. Thanks. Thanks a lot.